The scripture this morning is Romans 14, verses 1 through 8. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Oh, all right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and I, I especially want to thank again my friend Todd Bosiger for sharing his music with us. Uh, Todd lives 400 miles away in Sydney, Nebraska, so he had to get up really early this morning. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he came earlier because uh, Todd has family in and around Lincoln. And uh, so uh, anyway, Todd, how this all happened you know, was, uh, of course, back in March, we still weren't meeting in person yet, but I was hoping by summer we would. And it was during March Madness finals that Todd and I were texting each other about the games and his brother and all that kind of stuff. And said, well, why don't you come to Faith Westwood and sing? And so we started planning all this out, and, and I'm glad it all happened. Uh, and I also remember, you know, uh, you know, Todd was only on our staff for a short time, but, but uh, continued to be part of our church for a while. And, and I remember a number of times, we haven't always seen each other a lot, but I remember there were times when we would get together and, and have lunch at Hy-Vee and talk through stuff together. And uh, so, so glad to be able to renew this uh, friendship. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we, we uh, ask you to pour out your, your overflowing blessings upon our middle school students and our leaders who are soon to be arriving in Oklahoma City for their mission trip. And uh, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will reveal yourself to them this week in a beautiful, powerful way uh, as they serve and as they bless people and are blessed by them. And, Lord, uh, I would just look forward to seeing them coming back as a closer group, closer knit, united as sisters and brothers in Christ. And so, Holy Spirit, be at work in them so that Jesus can be displayed through them. And, Lord, we're asking you to open our eyes and ears to your word this morning. Open our hearts to receive your grace and truth. We pray in the name of Jesus who embodies grace and truth. And all God's people said, amen. Well, today we're continuing our series called Offshoots, which is about uh, religious spinoffs of Christianity. And while it's important to know something about these various uh, groups, the real reason that we're doing this is to clarify what we believe and why. Our theme for this series comes from Titus chapter 1, verse 9. I'm using the contemporary English version for this, um, and it tells us to pay attention. It says they must pay attention to the reliable message that is, as it has been taught to them so that they can encourage people with healthy instruction and refute those who speak against it. Now, part of my job as the spiritual elder of this church is to teach you 
and to mature you in the faith so that you do not become led astray by a, by a false gospel. First uh, Sunday in July, we looked at Christian nationalism, which isn't really a different religion. It's more of an ideology. Uh, but the next three Sundays, uh, they are distinct religions. Last Sunday, we looked at Mormonism. Today, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. And then next week, Christian science. Someone asked me, Steve, why did you pick those three religious faiths to talk about this week? And people have even suggested to me others. And I said, well, in each case here, I've known someone who is either in or was in uh, that faith. And I also believe that they represent things that are kind of cultural options in the religious landscape today. And so today's question is, what do Seventh-day Adventists teach? There are 1.2 million Adventists in the United States and about 20 million or more uh, worldwide, which is more than the United Methodists uh, globally. Uh, Omaha has a uh, Seventh-day Adventist Academy for on 70, North 72nd Street for first through eighth grades. Maybe some of you uh, knew about that. There's an Adventist college in Lincoln. And while not every Adventist believes the same thing, as you would imagine, the question for us today is, what do they teach? What do they teach? Ex-Adventist uh, Teresa Beam gives an example of how an Adventist might go about witnessing. All right? uh, an Adventist says, do you believe in the Ten Commandments that they are God's law? Christian says, yeah. Adventist says, uh, do, you do you believe in the Ten Commandments? Um, Excuse me, do you, obey, do you obey the Ten Commandments? And the Christian says, well, I try to. The Adventist follows up, do you worship God then on the, on, and rest on the seventh day Sabbath? Christian says, well, I go to church on Sunday. The Adventist says, well, then you are breaking the fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, and you are disobeying God. Christian comes back with, but, but I go to church on the Lord's Day. You know, it, it, it was changed. The Adventist is ready with a reply. Did you know that the Pope changed the Sabbath in the 4th century? Roman Emperor Constantine and the Catholic Church went against God's holy law and unilaterally switched the 7th day Sabbath to Sunday. At that point, the Christian either walks away and said, oh, forget about it, or they get pulled in. Seventh-day Adventists don't normally go to believers with their message. Did you know that? They target Christians. If an Adventist was witnessing to me, I might bring up Romans 14 that Jen just read for us. Uh, Paul is writing to the sisters and brothers in Rome, which included both Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. They probably all gather together to worship on Sundays in honor of the Lord's Day, the, his resurrection. But the Jewish Christians also observed Saturday as their Sabbath. I mean, it's what they grew up with. It's what they know. It's what they're used to. The Gentile Christians do not observe the Saturday Sabbath. And so Paul is wanting them to not be divided. He says, one person consider, considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each one of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. <laughs> What's the bottom line? It's in that Saturday Sabbath is optional. It's optional for Christians. If you want to do it, go right ahead. But it's no big deal. Paul also writes to the Christians in Colossae because false teachers have shown up and they're telling them that they, they, these Christians cannot please God unless they follow all of the Old Testament dietary restrictions and observe Saturday, Sabbath, and the other Jewish holy days. Paul says, no, no, no. You don't have to do that to please God. He says, therefore... Uh, if we can go to the next slide. There. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat and dr or drink or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a what? 
a Sabbath day. Paul knows that keeping the Sabbath day, he knows it's one of the Ten Commandments. He was a way better Old Testament scholar than you and I will ever be. He also knows that the other nine commandments carry over as part of the new covenant in Jesus. They're part of how we love God and we love our neighbor. But the Sabbath commandment, the Sabbath commandment, plus the other commands, such as those that require circumcision and forget, forbid eating pork and sh- shellfish, etc. All of this was part of God's covenant with Israel, not a part of the new covenant with Christ. Seventh-day Adventists not only sir, uh, observe Saturday Sabbath, just like traditional Jews, they also avoid eating pork and shellfish like traditional Jews, Plus, Adventists have added a lot of other rules about what God requires. Now, sometimes Christians have jumped onto that same legalistic bandwagon by enforcing all the things that have to be that you can do and not do on the Sunday because they say it's the new Sabbath. Um, All these extra rules, none of which you will find in the Bible. Sure. We need times of rest. It's made up into who we are, right? But it's not an obligation that you have to do it on a certain day of the week or God won't be pleased with you. The book of Hebrews in the Bible tells Jesus' people that there's a more important rest than the seventh-day Sabbath. It's resting in God's grace. It's resting in his affirmation, which is received, not achieved. Hebrews 4, verses 9 and 10 say, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. We rest because our salvation is is received by faith, not achieved by works. And let me tell you, that is the best rest of all. So what is the Christian perspective on the Sabbath? Here it is, and I I would propose this as the heart of today's message. For Jesus' people, the Old Testament Sabbath is obsolete. In the new covenant, Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and we rest in his grace as a gift from God. I I have an appointment this afternoon with my recliner. (laughs) Hey, it's Sunday, right? You know, I, I, I expend a lot of energy on Sunday mornings. Of course, and I, and I like to stretch out, you know, and uh, lean back. And, and uh, sometimes I, I kind of say this to myself. <sighs> Rest is a gift from God. And if you are a nonstop worker, you probably need to tell yourself that too. Rest is a gift from God. So, you know, I plan to have a relaxing day. Now, obviously, something could come up and change those plans, and so I'll have to get that rest some other time, but I still need it, right? And when I get it, I say, thank you, God. So you say what you see here on the screen with me, the heart of the message. For Jesus' people, the Old Testament Sabbath law is obsolete. In the New Covenant, Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and we rest in his grace as a gift from God. Now, let's look at the Seventh-day Adventist movement, shall we? The Second Great Awakening was a period of great spiritual fervor in the United States, especially kind of in the New England area. During the first half of the 1800s, the Methodist Church and other groups uh, grew tremendously, but there were also excesses. A farmer named William Miller... Not our William Miller, who's here right now, but anyway. 
Uh, William Miller in upstate New York uh, took a few verses from the prophet Daniel, and by working in his own calculations, he announced that Jesus would return somewhere between the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844. Miller convinced a lot of people that he was right. Most pastors uh, said that his interpretations were off, they were off base, but a number of people believed him, and they became known as Millerites. Sometime later, they took the name Adventist because Advent means coming, and that was the focus of their teaching, the second coming of Christ. Now, when Jesus did not return in the spring of 44, that was trouble, but Good news for Miller, he came up with a new calculation. It was, he said it was going to happen um, later that year, when? On October 22nd. I guess he forgot that Jesus said that no one knows the hour or the day of his return, but Miller published his predictions in a series of articles, and then a regional movement became a national campaign. Miller's followers everywhere prepared for that day. Some of them sold their homes and their farms and their businesses, dirt cheap. I mean, they were ready to go. Beam us up, God. Now, you know what happened. The sun rose on October 23rd. Jesus had not come. He became known as the Great Disappointment. One Adventist said, Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. We wept and wept till the day dawned. That same Adventist believer, a Methodist farmer, by the way, was walking through a cornfield on October 23rd, and he reported seeing a vision And this vision explained why Jesus had not returned as predicted. He said the date was right, but the location was wrong. He said Jesus didn't come to earth on October 22nd. Instead, he moved to a different part of heaven. He left the outer sanctuary of heaven and entered the inner sanctuary to do the final phase of his atoning work and begin his judgment. Well, as you can imagine... Adventists leaped on that explanation. I mean, like like ants on honey. You know, they were, oh, yeah. Uh, They were relieved that that they weren't completely wrong after all. Well, this theory became published and came into the hands of former Methodist Ellen White and her husband James. Soon they would begin traveling around teaching this Adventist claim Uh, that on October 22nd, 1844, Jesus entered heaven's inner sanctuary to take inventory of his people and their unconfessed sins. About that time, Ellen and James White also adopted Sabbatarianism, which was another offshoot movement kind of springing up at the time. So they started teaching that if you're not worshiping God on the seventh day, you're not worshiping God at all. Now, we don't believe that, do we? What do we believe? For Jesus' people, the Old Testament Sabbath law is obsolete. In the New Covenant, Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and we rest in his grace as a gift from God. Well, as the whites uh, traveled about speaking, Ellen would often fall into uh, trance, a trances. During, during the, as people were gathered there watching, she would fall, lay down and fall into a trance and, uh, and, and, have, and then claim that during that time she was having visions of heavenly things. Um, she claimed to have received more than 2,000 visions and dreams from God during her lifetime. The, these revelations became the heart of her prolific writing career, which included 5,000 articles and 40 books. Ellen G. White and her husband James were co-founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The written works of Ellen G. White hold authority as Scripture, equal with Scripture for Adventists. And those writings are for them the authoritative interpreter 
of the Bible. Most people, most of us know today uh, Seventh-day Adventists for three things. It's seminars and end prophecy, keeping this Saturday as Sabbath, and vegetarianism. Uh, Ellen G. White adopted vegetarianism, and now so do about 70% of Adventist church members. A couple of months ago, I told you about a, a, a few Adventist college students who started coming to my church in Lincoln about 20 years ago. One of them was a young guy named Jonathan. A few years later, Jonathan told me why they were there. He said they had come to build relationships with, with some of our people and start sowing seeds of doubt about worshiping on Sundays, hoping to turn a few of them into Seventh-day Adventists. Well, I had no idea. I just thought they had come to, to worship God on a, you know, an extra day of the week and grow in their faith. I didn't know. And then something happened. Jonathan did not expect. See, Jonathan was thoroughly raised in the Adventist bubble. His father was an Adventist pastor. He was an, his father was an Adventist seminary professor. Um, Jonathan went, grew up going to Adventist schools, uh, was going to Adventist college. But when he visited our church, when we were meeting in a middle school cafeteria, he witnessed something he had never seen before. People were enjoying their life in God. Uh, Jonathan had never seen people so free in their faith, so full of joy in the Lord. He had not, never known faith apart from burden and guilt and fear of judgment. Now, the other Adventist students eventually stopped worshiping at our church, but Jonathan stayed. You see, the gospel was winning him over. For the first time in his life, Jonathan began to hear the Bible without that Adventist filter. It was, it was all so new to him. Today, Jonathan is the pastor of a, uh, a Christian church in Riverside, California, and, uh, you know, Jonathan and I haven't kept up in, a, in a, you know, for a while. We've exchanged some kind of messages, but this week um, I called him. And, uh, he, and he said, after we, and I picked his brain about all this kind of stuff some, and, and uh, he said that it would be okay if I shared not only his story but also his name. I told him, you know, I said, a lot of us Christians have seen Seventh-day Adventists as just another Christian denomination with a few, you know, kind of quirky beliefs and things they do. The North American uh, Adventist website describes them in bold letters as a mainstream Protestant church. He says that's the image they're trying to cultivate among us. I told Jonathan, when I, when I look at the list of, uh, the Adventist list of their 28 beliefs, you know, all but a handful of them, I would say, well, I believe that too. Jonathan said those statements have been carefully crafted to sound more like what the average Christian believes, but when you get into the SDA, the, the Seventh-day Adventist church, you discover they mean some very different things. One of their 28 uh, beliefs is that Ellen G. White possessed the true gift of prophecy. Uh, in one of her early visions, she saw the innermost sanctuary of heaven and the stones, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. She said a golden halo encircled the fourth commandment, uh, elevating it above every other commandment. In another vision, she learned that the, the message of the three angels in the book of Revelation, the first three angels, was about the true believers who worship on the seventh day and the false believers who would get the mark of the beast because they worshiped on Sundays. She also said 
that Jesus forgives your previous sins when you come to believe in him. But after that, you'd better be perfect. And if you're not, then every single sin has to be confessed or it will condemn you. And since we don't know, uh, you know, always when we've sinned, and because the SDA church forbids a whole lot of extra things, an Adventist has to do a whole lot of confessing all the time. I remember hearing uh, Adventist college students one time complain that most yogurts on the market these days contain gelatin, which is an animal product. Now, as vegetarians, though not vegans, they would feel guilty about eating gelatin-thickened yogurt. An Adventist girl is told that wearing jewelry is wrong. Now, she can wear a brooch but not a bracelet. She's puzzled as why she can't wear a pair of cheap earrings because that would be too ostentatious, uh, ostentatious when it's okay for an Adventist man to wear a Rolex watch. If Adventists put pepper on their potatoes or drink a cup of coffee or a Coke or play a round of golf on Saturday, they're going to feel great anguish for their sins. You can see why Jonathan called his previous Adventist faith a burden. I find it ironic that a faith that focuses so much on resting on the Sabbath would experience such a heavy burden and so little rest. As Jesus' people, our acceptance from God is not about what we achieve. It's about what we receive. That's where our rest comes from. So I want to give the heart of the message one more time. And I know some of you have grown up hearing the Ten Commandments and equating Sunday exactly with the Sabbath. This seems going to not quite ring to you well, but I want you to think about it. For Jesus' people, the Old Testament Sabbath law is obsolete in the New Covenant Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and we rest in his grace as a gift from God. We don't have to worship on Sundays, do we? We could worship on Saturdays, Mondays, or any other day. No particular day is required. In the first century, after Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven, it became common for his people to gather on the first day of the week. After all, that was the day of the resurrection. They called it the Lord's Day. In, in Acts chapter 20, uh, we find the sisters and brothers in Troas meeting together in the evening on the first day of the week. It says they break bread, which probably means communion. And it said that Paul taught them. Paul wrote to the Corinthians uh, about their mission offerings to Jerusalem. Uh, he told them, here's what I want you to do. Set aside some money um, uh, on the first day of every week until I get there. Why did he say the first day of the week? Well, because that's when they got together. That's when the Christians gathered to worship and to learn and to be family for each other. And you know, I think about all that we've been through over the last more than a year? We know now, don't we, how important it is to come together as Jesus' people, to worship, to learn, to be family for each other. And we are a part of a tradition that has stretched for more than 20 centuries of people who gather on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. Let's pray. Jesus, we love coming here together and being with you. We love receiving your, your grace and then pouring our, our worship and appreciation and love back to you. Lord, we are so grateful to get to be here on this first day, the Lord's Day. We ask that you will fill us with the joy of the Holy Spirit, 
that we will not be dour and sour and bird, carry such a heavy burden in our faith that we, don't, we lose the joy. Give us eyes to see your glory in the faces of our sisters and brothers about us. Jesus, you are our Sabbath rest. Thank you. We know now that the Old Testament Sabbath was pointing all along to our rest in you. You have fulfilled it. And today, we rest in your grace and give you the glory. And all God's people said, amen.